Hi, my name is David Bennett, Curator of Maritime History for the North Carolina Maritime Museum System. And today I'm going to be discussing naval support at the Battle of Plymouth from April 17th to 20th, 1864. So, during the Civil War, much of eastern North Carolina fell under uh, federal control uh, during the Burnside Expedition uh, of the winter and spring of 1862. And uh, out of that, uh, New Bern, North Carolina, right here, became uh, the central um, uh, military base for federal forces in eastern North Carolina. There is also an outpost, uh, Beaufort and Moorhead City, down here. Uh, another outpost was at Washington, and another outpost at Plymouth, North Carolina. And of course, Plymouth is the subject of our discussion today. Um, there was another federal outpost at uh, Roanoke Island, however, that's uh, not featured on this map. Okay, so Plymouth, prior to federal occupation, uh, was, lo uh, was located in Washington County. It was the county seat, and it was, um, which is northeastern North Carolina, and it was seated right on the uh, banks of the Roanoke River. So we've got Plymouth right here, the Roanoke, and we have the Albemarle Sound. Now, Plymouth was a federal port of entry. There was a U.S. Customs House on the waterfront, and uh, which regulated uh, trade um, in the area on the river, and it also uh, levied taxes. It was a pretty, it was a fairly prosperous community that uh, benefited from several uh, industries, including uh, naval stores, uh, agriculture, lumber, and uh, shipping. Um, the population was around 409 whites, 62 free blacks, and 401 slaves. Uh, Plymouth itself as a community and uh, Washington County as well um, was divided politically leading up to and during the Civil War. Uh, there are many people in Washington County and Plymouth who were not in favor of secession. They preferred uh, to stay in the United States or the preferred union. Um, however, um, North Carolina did secede um, and join the Confederacy. And here's just a, a serene image of downtown uh, Plymouth along the Roanoke River. Now, Plymouth came under federal occupation um, in May of 1862 when the Navy arrived. Um, Major General Burnside uh, quickly established uh, an, a garrison in the town, and uh, over time the town became heavily fortified. Um, in December of 1862, Confeder the Confederate Army attacked Plymouth. It did not retake the town, however, uh, Confederate infantry did move into the town, and uh, part of the town caught fire and burned uh, due to uh, supporting naval gunfire from federal gunboats. The importance of Plymouth uh, was that it controlled access to the Albemarle Sound, and it also controlled traffic on the Roanoke River, uh, which was essential for both uh, the Confederacy and uh, the federal forces, uh, both of whom needed to move men and supplies along the Roanoke River. Um, and uh, the, the Confederacy really couldn't do that uh, with uh, the federal gunboats based out of Plymouth. Um, the federal gunboats were also conducting raids uh, farther upriver, and uh, and, uh, and, and threatening uh, uh, civilian communities as well as uh, Confederate uh, weapons depots and uh, food depots. Um, it also controlled access to the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula, which was rich in naval stores, lumber, and it was the breadbasket of North Carolina. It was one of the agriculture centers in eastern North Carolina. And at this point, in the war in 1864, uh, the Confederacy was desperate for food uh, to feed its civilian population and uh, to keep its army going. Uh, federal forces were also recruiting North Carolinians um, into the army um, out of Plymouth. Uh, but one of the, the main reasons Plymouth was really important was because it threatened uh, the uh, the Wilmington 
uh, Richmond Railroad line. Um, so in 1864, Wilmington was the last Confederate port that was still open, and uh, 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 weapons, uh, medicine, food, uh, clothing were coming in from abroad into Wilmington, and they were being shipped up to Richmond um, to uh, supply General Lee's army. And the fear was that if federal forces could push up the Roanoke River, uh, they could sever uh, the, uh, uh, the railroad line at Weldon. Um, the railroad actually crossed the Roanoke River at Weldon, North Carolina. And so uh, Confederate forces feared that it would either be captured or destroyed, which would quickly uh, uh, end the war. Um, they did uh, put up defenses on the Roanoke River. Um, you had Fort Branch uh, below Hamilton, North Carolina. Uh, that was there uh, to protect the Weldon, uh, to protect the railroad line at Weldon, and uh, also civilian communities, as well as uh, uh, the, the construction site for the CSS Albemarle. So it was decided ultimately that um, Confederate forces need to retake uh, eastern North Carolina and critical to that was taking Plymouth. And the man in charge of this campaign to retake Eastern North Carolina was Brigadier General Robert F. Hoke. Um, he was a native of Lincoln, North Carolina, and a graduate of the Kentucky Military Institute. Uh, he had a remarkable military career. He went from second lieutenant to Brigadier General in less than two years, and he achieved that rank at the age of 26. Um, of course, during the Civil War, uh, there's a high attrition rate amongst officers, and uh, he was also an exceptional leader as well, which uh, is why he was able to attain that rank so quickly. Um, and like I said, he was the commanding officer of Confederate forces at the Battle of Plymouth, and after the battle, he was promoted to Major General. And these are his forces that he had underneath him. Um, it was round... There's over 7,000 men that he had available for his attack. And then he was uh, supposed to, Hoke was supposed to have coordinated um, his operations with Commander James Cook of the Confederate Navy. Uh, Cook was a native of Beaufort, North Carolina, who's orphaned at an early age, and he uh, made the U.S. Navy his life. Um, and uh, when North Carolina seceded from the Union, he chose to join the Confederate Navy and uh, conducted operations in eastern North Carolina. Um, he was eventually um, helped oversee the construction of the CSS Albemarle, uh, which we'll discuss here in just a minute. And um, he was later promoted to captain um, and made a commanding officer of Confederate Naval Forces in North Carolina um, after the the Battle of Plymouth and the Battle of Albemarle Sound. Okay, the CSS Albemarle um, was going to be part of the uh, offensive operations against Plymouth and uh, was also going to participate in the recapture of uh, eastern North Carolina from federal forces. It was 152 feet length overall. Uh, it had a, 45 feet at the beam and it had 8 feet of draft. It's casemate. This uh, superstructure right here uh, was wooden uh, with iron plating on it. It was armed with two Brooks rifles that could be rotated to fire, fire out of different gun ports. Um, but its real weapon, its its real offensive weapon, was an 18-foot uh, ram that was made of oak and plated with iron. Um, it was powered by 200 horsepower engines, two 200 horsepower engines, and it had uh, two screws uh, underwater. So Gilbert Elliott was the man tasked with uh, overseeing the construction of the Albemarle. He was originally from Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and grew up around the shipbuilding industry. Uh, at the outbreak of the war, he joined the Confederate Army as an officer and was assigned to Special Naval Service. Um, in the spring of 1863, he was tasked with uh, constructing the uh, CSS Albemarle and um, the site of Edwards Ferry. Um, which is not far from Scotland Neck, North Carolina, um, was chosen um, 
as a spot. It was actually constructed in a uh, cornfield on the banks of the Roanoke River. And it's, it's, it's so impressive. He was 20 years old at the time when he was selected uh, for this job. Uh, such a massive amount of responsibility, as well as uh, a lot of technical work for such a young man. Uh, the plans for the album are all, uh, were laid out by uh, John L. Porter, chief constructor of the Confederate Navy. And here's some just very basic uh, construction plans of the album model. Um, we've got the uh, the screws or the props right here, casemate, the Brooks rifles right here, showing that they're able to be rotated to fire out of uh, gun ports. And just here's another image of the album model under construction. Okay, now on to uh, the, the men defending Plymouth. Uh, we have Brigadier General Henry W. Wessels. Uh, he was a uh, career military officer uh, with plenty of combat experience leading up to the Civil War. Um, and he was the commander of the garrison at Plymouth. He, and he had about 2,834 men under his command. Uh, just to, to note, the unattached recruits uh, were primarily were largely uh, black soldiers that recently been recruited um, into the uh, Union Army. However, uh, they had not um, been assigned to, uh, to units um, prior to the battle. Um, and then we also have uh, the second uh, two companies from the 2nd North Carolina Union Volunteers. Uh, many of those men were recruited um, from uh, northeastern North Carolina, um, and there was also quite a few uh, deserters from the Confederate Army who joined in, in that unit. Okay, this is Plymouth uh, it's, and its defenses uh, right before uh, the Battle of Plymouth. Uh, so its defenses are Fort Gray right here on the Roanoke River, uh, Fort Wessels just outside of town, uh, Fort Williams, which is really the central um, fort for the uh, defense of Plymouth. Conaby Redoubt, uh, a small uh, sort of earthen defense right here, and uh, Fort Comfort. And you'll see that um, you had earthworks going about three quarters of the way around the town. Um, however, not on this side. Um, this side was was incomplete, but you also have Conaby Creek and really dense uh, swamp uh, really covering this uh, eastern flank of the town. Uh, so in theory, it really shouldn't have been too much of a problem, um, especially with the presence of uh, Union gunboats to, uh, to cover this flank. Okay, and of course, the man in charge of the uh, Federal Naval Forces at Plymouth was Lieutenant Commander Charles W. Flusser, uh, Maryland native and a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. So, was a career naval officer, uh, rather young man at the time, and he had uh, about 410 sailors, a little bit more, under his command. Uh, and he had the bombshell series Massasoit, Miami, Southfield, Whitehead, um, under his command. And he also had a, a small steam launch, the Dolly, and the uh, Miami was his flagship. So we have the bombshell right here. This was actually a U.S. Army uh, gunboat. Um, the, the Army did have a handful of gunboats in eastern North Carolina that were primarily there to transport men and supplies and provo provide some uh, short-range uh, naval gunfire support. We have the USS Ceres, uh, small uh, paddle wheeler, side paddle wheeler. Uh, the USS Massasoit. The USS Miami, again, Flusser's flagship. The USS Southfield. Uh, however, this photo isn't actually of the Southfield. It's actually a photo of the USS Commodore Perry. Um, I couldn't find uh, a good enough uh, photo uh, or drawing of the Southfield. Um, however, it was similar in size and design to the Commodore Perry. Uh, both of the vessels had actually been... Uh, ferry boats, uh, double-ender uh, ferry boats, 
um, up in New York uh, prior to the outbreak of the war and had been obtained by the U.S. Navy and uh, armed. And then we've got the USS Whitehead, and the Whitehead's actually this smaller uh, vessel right here, um, not to be confused with this uh, larger side uh, paddle wheeler. Okay, now let's talk about the river defenses at Plymouth. Uh, there are quite a few. Um, Flusser uh, had sunk a number of vessels um, right here um, and sunk uh, some pilings in the river right here and also a little bit farther up the river as well. Um, and uh, they'd also placed um, underwater torpedoes or, or underwater mines, as we might call them uh, today, um, around that same area. And the hope was that um, if the Albemarle steamed through there, it would become hung up on those underwater wrecks, or it would collide with one of the underwater torpedoes and sink, or at least become heavily damaged. Um, then there's also a 100 pounder that was placed at Fort Gray and a 200 pounder placed here on the western end of uh, Plymouth's waterfront, and this was named Battery Wharf. And here's just an image of uh, what that 200 pounder would have looked like. All right, so now we're going to get on to the battle itself, uh, which began on April 17th. Now, early on, on April 17th, uh, there's another uh, U.S. naval vessel uh, present, the USS Tacone. Um, however, it was sent away from Plymouth uh, because it was believed that there's a greater threat at uh, Washington, um, and they didn't think that there was actually an attack that was going to take place on Plymouth earlier that day. They didn't think the Albemarle was ready, to, um, based on their intelligence, uh, to make its way down the Roanoke River, and uh, they knew that Plymouth was going to be attacked um, by both uh, Confederate naval and land forces, so they weren't quite expecting an attack on the 17th. Uh, there's also some correspondence um, uh, that suggests that there might have been a uh, a disagreement between the uh, commander of the Taconi, uh, Lieutenant Commander Truxton, and Lieutenant Commander Flusser over seniority, and uh, that could possibly be one of the reasons why uh, the Taconi left. But um, the uh, sort of official record was that uh, it wasn't needed and there was potentially a greater threat aimed at Washington, North Carolina. And, of course, uh, General Wessels in this... Uh, uh, correspondence here uh, notes that uh, having the uh, Taconi leave Plymouth was uh, a decision that he regretted. Okay, so the attack on Plymouth began on the evening of April 17th, 1864. Uh, Confederate forces uh, arrived um, around 4 o'clock, and an uh, artillery barrage began and went on until about nightfall, and there's uh, intermediate uh, skirmishing. Um, most of the Confederate forces came up uh, uh, right here um, out of the uh, southwest um, into uh, Plymouth. Uh, Ransom's Brigade is right here, Mercer and Kemper's Brigade, and there's a number of uh, Confederate infantry forces, uh, elements of the 11th Virginia were out here laying siege to Fort Gray, and then farther upriver you had uh, Colonel Deering with his uh, artillery about two miles upriver um, uh, bombarding Fort Gray. Okay, at 2 p.m., um, the USS Whitehead uh, went uh, was posted up close... Uh, fairly close to Fort Gray, um, to wait and watch for the CSS Albemarle. Uh, by 6 p.m., the Whitehead had moved farther upriver uh, beyond uh, these obstructions here um, and beyond uh, Fort Gray to, uh, to continue to look out for the Albemarle. And the series was commanded to go and uh, communicate with the Whitehead um, 
and during that it was struck by uh, artillery fire um, from Colonel Deering's artillery units. Uh, two men were killed and eight were wounded. Uh, under the cover of darkness, the USS Massasoit made two trips out to Roanoke Island to evacuate uh, women, children, runaway slaves, and other non-combatants, um, primarily civilians, uh, out to Roanoke Island. And the Massasoit's operations essentially took it um, out of the equation uh, for the rest of the Battle of Plymouth. On the morning of April 18th, 1864, um, Fort Gray, um, or rather, um, I should say, the uh, Federal um, Artillery and, um, and Naval gunboats began barding Confederate lines, and Fort Gray um, came under attack. Um, however, uh, Confederate forces were repulsed, um, but they uh, suffered heavy casualties, and they didn't really make uh, much more of a, an attempt to charge that fortification for the remainder of the battle. And uh, as, as I mentioned, Fort Gray was charged by the enemy at dawn. Um, you had the USS bombshell was in the process of communicating with that fort, so that was probably passing messages, uh, moving supplies such as uh, ammunition, uh, possibly men, um, and it was also providing um, some supporting gunfire. And uh, it was struck um, several times below the waterline by enemy fire from uh, Colonel Deering's guns. And it returned to Plymouth, but as soon as it pulled up to the wharf, it sank, removing the bombshell uh, from the equation. From noon to 6 p.m., Confederate forces bombarded Fort Wessels right here, and they continued to bombard Fort Gray. And all the while, um, there's an exchange of gunfire uh, from these uh, these Union fortifications as well as um, from the Federal gunboats. So let's talk about supporting fire from the Navy, because we are talking about uh, naval support at the Battle of Plymouth, after all. Um, the the Federal Navy had a variety of guns present um, at the battle, and the uh, for, the, the forward most uh, Confederate lines were less than a mile from the Roanoke River, and uh, the majority of the guns they had had the ability to um, to, to rain down um, shells on Confederate positions, uh, particularly their most the heaviest gun, which was the nine-inch Dahlgren. Um, was able to uh, hit um, targets out to uh, up to two miles away, and uh, your uh, hundred-pounder Parrot rifles were able to potentially hit targets at um, almost four and a half miles away. So right here, I've got some satellite imagery of Plymouth and Washington County, and um, this yellow line right here indicates um, how far out um, the uh, artillery was coming down from the uh, nine-inch Dahlgrens. And um, basically from this point right here all the way up to here is where the uh, Confederate uh, troops were located. And this was essentially the zone where uh, the Federal Navy was dropping its shells. So how did the federal gunboats coordinate their fire with federal ground forces? Well, um, the federal forces knew prior to the Battle of Plymouth probably where they were more, most likely to be attacked. And so they had pre-planned their um, naval gunfire. Um, they already had the coordinates. They knew um, the elevation that they needed for their guns. They knew um, how to cut their fuses. Um, they are using a lot of... Uh, timed fuses um, so they could get air bursts um, above their targets uh, that they so desired. Um, the U Union Army also had artillery observers. Uh, some of the accounts um, talk about artillery observers being in um, uh, church steeples and able to observe the Confederate lines. Um, and there's also several um, 
uh, pieces of correspondence and records that indicate that uh, messages were probably being passed by canoe uh, from the army out to the navy and at least on one occasion we do know that flusser um, came ashore to talk to general wessels uh, during the battle and then uh, I have a couple of uh, accounts that I just want to read y'all um, about naval gunfire from the USS Miami. Um, we have one from this young man, uh, Sarah Nichols, writing to his mother um, that at 4 o'clock we opened with our guns and firing over the heads of our own forces planted our shell right in the midst of the enemy, repulsed them three times, and finally drove them five miles back from the town. I don't know if they actually pushed them back five miles, but they certainly uh, probably pushed them uh, beyond the range of where uh, where the Navy was dropping its shells. And then um, on the other side, the Confederate Army, uh, the 8th North Carolina Volunteers, we have an account um, from one man who wrote, the gunboats um, in the river also took part in shelling our batteries and line. One shell from a gunboat came over the town, struck the ground about 150 yards in front of the 8th, ricocheted, and the next time struck the ground uh, in the line of the regiment and exploded, killing and wounding 15 men of Company H. Okay, so back to the battle. From 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. on the 18th, um, the attacks continued at 6 p.m., the Confederate infantry uh, attacked for, um, Fort Wessels right here. And uh, during the attack, uh, uh, Colonel Mercer um, was killed in action. Um, while this attack was taking place, General Ransom ordered an attack on Fort Williams, uh, sort of a diversionary, diversionary attack, and his units uh, suffered heavy casualties. Um, all the while, there's naval gunfire coming down, um, and uh, Fort Wessels surrendered at 11 p.m. Uh, one of the reasons why it was forced to surrender was it was um, it was suffering from heavy Confederate artillery fire. However, it received some friendly fire from uh, one of the, the federal gunboats. Uh, two exploding shells um, struck the fort, one on the parapets, and one right in front of the door of the magazine. Um, during the battle, Captain Nelson Chapman, the commanding officer, was killed, and ultimately the fear was that um, if another shell landed inside the fort, it might actually set off the magazine and blow everyone up. And here's a, an account um, of that nighttime um, artillery exchange by an anonymous correspondent with the Richmond Daily Examiner, and he wrote, The action commenced about sunset, the night being perfectly clear with a full moon. Every object was visible. The sight was magnificent. The screaming, hissing shells meeting and passing each other through the sulfurous air appeared like blazing comets with their burning fuses and would uh, burst with, fearful, uh, with frightful noise, scattering their fragments as thick as hail. And so there's just an awe-inspiring and an absolutely terrifying image uh, put eloquently. Um, all the while, while the battle is taking place, um, CSS Albemarle received orders to steam for Plymouth, and it was joined by uh, the CSS Cotton Plant. And on the way down, uh, Albemarle suffered from uh, quite a few engine problems, and uh, the rudder was damaged, and uh, just in order to try and um, uh, better handle uh, the, the vessel, that it was not an easy vessel to maneuver, uh, they actually went stern down, uh, stern first down the Roanoke River, um, and the vessel was even finished uh, when it uh, started steaming for Plymouth. Uh, men were still working on the vessel uh, to get it ready for, for action on the way down the river. And uh, it arrived uh, just above uh, Plymouth around 10 o'clock at night. And it was uh, just before that, around 8, 10 p.m., the USS Whitehead uh, spotted the CSS Albemarle and cotton plant coming down the river. It fired off uh, a rocket to warn 
uh, forces at Plymouth, and then um, unable to go back down the river due to uh, Confederate artillery, it decided to go um, take this thoroughfare up to the Cashew River, and uh, which was not an easy task, as you can see how narrow and how a winding it is. But once it got out to the Cashew River, it was able to get out to the Albemarle Sound, and then from the Albemarle Sound, go back up the Roanoke River and back to Plymouth. Um, but once um, the Albemarle was about three miles from Plymouth, it stopped um, due to those uh, underwater obstructions. And uh, 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 the Commander Hook wasn't sure what to do. He was afraid of getting hung up on those sunken vessels. And um, uh, he, uh, he, he wasn't sure if he was actually going to be able to get to Plymouth. Uh, Gilbert Elliott, however, had volunteered to come along as an aide um, on the trip. Or, um, and uh, he, he, he volunteered to go out and conduct soundings. And uh, he um, discovered that there's 10 feet of water over the obstructions which would have allowed uh, the Albemarle to continue down the river to Plymouth. And it was due to a freshet that was taking place. So in other words, um, there had been a lot of rainfall that had taken place, and the, uh, the river was flooding. And so there was just enough room to get over those, um, uh, those obstructions. Uh, as we recall, there, the Albemarle had um, uh, a draft of eight feet, so just uh, two feet between uh, the bottom of its hull and those obstructions. And the CSS Albemarle was also able to slip past uh, the other river defenses. Um, there's that 100 pounder um, at Warren's Neck or Fort Gray um, that did fire at point blank range on the Albemarle, but to no effect. And then the 200 pounder Battery Worth, for some reason, never fired on the Albemarle at all. Um, now, just prior to um, the, the Albemarle arriving in downtown Plymouth, uh, the Whitehead had returned about 12.30 a.m. Um, and uh, it was at 3.15 the USS Ceres had spotted the Albemarle and uh, reported it to, uh, to Flusser. And then, of course, we have the sort of the pinnacle of the naval engagement at Plymouth, the CSS Albemarle ramming and sinking the USS Southfield. And uh, let me just uh, read an account um, from Lieutenant French, who was in command of the Southfield, um, of this. Um, he wrote that the Albemarle struck the Southfield on her starboard bow, her prow cut through the forward storeroom and into the fire room. Almost at the moment of contact, our two vessels opened a rapid fire both of great guns and musketry, which was maintained by the Southfield until she sunk. About three minutes from the time of contact, the ram opened fire with her bow pivot gun and kept up a continuous hail of musketry. When I found the Southfield sinking, I ordered her crew to leave in the boats. At this moment, the Miami stern swung into us, and I then ordered such men as could do so to jump onto her decks, and did so myself. Uh, then from the opposite side, um, we have uh, Commander Cook in the Albemarle, and he wrote of the action, I moved down and discovered two of the enemy vessels chained together, lying about half a mile below the town. I ran into one of them, the Southfield, commanded by Lieutenant French, the U.S. Navy, carrying six guns and with a crew of 117 men. The prow of the Albemarle extended about 10 feet into the sides of the Southfield sinking the latter vessel. I immediately commenced backing the Albemarle, but was unable to extricate her from the sinking vessel for some time. In the meanwhile, the weight of the vessel so depressed the forward deck of the Albemarle as to cause the water to run into the forward port. The Miami, commanded by Captain Flusser, the senior naval officer at station, carrying 13 guns, then poured broadside after broadside upon the port side of the Albemarle shield. Being, of course, unable to work my great guns while in this condition, I ordered all the crew on the top deck and engaged the enemy in close conflict with small arms. At this time, I lost one man, Harris, 
killed with a pistol shot. As soon as, as I was uh, relieved from the weight of the sinking vessel, I opened fire upon the Miami, but after striking her several times, she succeeded in making her escape. And of course, the uh, Albemarle nearly uh, sank itself in the process of uh, sinking the uh, Southfield. And here we have an image of the uh, the sunken Southfield with the uh, Albemarle pursuing the uh, Miami down the Roanoke River. And of course, uh, Lieutenant Commander Flusser was killed in action uh, during this exchange. And uh, what happened was that he was trying to fire an exploding shell through into the CSS Albemarle uh, through one of its portholes. And um, the shell ricocheted off the Almaraz casemate and came straight back at him and exploded and uh, tore him to pieces. Um, afterwards, the Miami series and the Whitehead were uh, forced to withdraw from combat. So here we are after um, the, uh, the, uh, the Federal Navy is driven from the Roanoke. Um, the, the cotton plant and the uh, Albemarle probably a little bit farther down the river at this point, um, but uh, you had uh, these Confederate uh, units were able to move in more on this uh, western flank and sort of tighten the noose on Plymouth. And again, this is uh, late at night or very early in the morning. It's still dark out on the uh, on the 19th and then you know how did the Albemarle and the comp plant coordinate with confederate ground forces well gilbert elliott again volunteered and this time he went ashore to uh, communicate with confederate ground forces uh, we don't have a whole lot of details on how he exactly did this um, and it was probably a really difficult journey because we do know that he went farther down river and uh, made his way around the eastern side of the town probably and he would have had to have crossed through a dense swamp uh, crossed at least one uh, creek and um, made his way out to uh, confederate ground forces which would have taken quite a bit of time and uh, it, the, the details are our mystery today okay so that um, evening of the 19th, uh, Ransom's Brigade uh, does something quite ingenious. Uh, it actually crosses Conaby Creek here and uh, goes through this dense swamp. Um, uh, and there had been a lot of rain, remember, so this uh, swamp was flooded. And uh, they were actually having to move uh, men, equipment, ammunition, artillery uh, through these conditions, which would have been incredibly difficult and came across Conaby Creek again. Uh, the bridge here had been taken out prior to the battle, um, so again had to cross um, that creek, and they, done that, they did that by pontoon. So early, early in the morning, uh, around 4.30 a.m., uh, Ransom's Brigade launches its attack on the eastern flank of Plymouth, and this is the final attack that leads to the fall of Plymouth. And they had coordinated with the cotton plant and the Albemarle, who had come, who were moving down the river alongside uh, the Confederate infantry, providing naval gunfire support. Um, and we know this from a couple of accounts. Uh, there's one um, Union soldier who, who wrote that uh, as the uh, uh, Albemarle and the Cotton Platte were coming up the river. Uh, it sounded like a peal of thunder when their uh, their guns started going off. And uh, there's also um, some friendly fire that uh, Confederate infantry received uh, from the Albemarle during this attack. Um, but you had uh, two units move in along the uh, shore. One of the units actually went all the way out to Battery Worth and captured Battery Worth, which took that 200 pounder um, out of the equation which allowed the cotton plant and the Albemarle to move farther up onto the uh, uh, waterfront area. Uh, you had another unit uh, make this sort of roundabout uh, movement to attack uh, Conaby Readout uh, 
and one unit attacked Fort Comfort while another attacked this uh, smaller fortification. And they were able to drive into the town and fight uh, house to house, uh, street by street. And eventually, um, the troops, uh, the remaining troops, uh, uh, Union troops, fell back into Fort Williams, uh, where they were bombarded uh, by both Confederate artillery and by the cotton plant in the Albemarle. Um, at this point, at, at one point, uh, Matt Ransom um, asks Wessels if he would like to surrender um, and told him it was in his best interest, um, that he couldn't uh, guarantee their safety um, if they uh, put up, continued to put up a, a strong defense. And uh, Wessels hadn't suffered too many casualties, um, and he thought it was his responsibility to try and hold out a little while longer, and so there was uh, more and more um, uh, artillery fire, and it was becoming more and more accurate, and eventually uh, he was placed in a position where he just had to give up. There was no way out of it. Uh, the game was up for them. And I, it's important to note that um, Fort Gray was the last fortification to hold out, and it did not surrender until um, Fort uh, Williams uh, fell right here. So the surrender of Plymouth took place at 10 a.m. on uh, April 20th. Um, you had some of the North Carolina Union uh, infantrymen were able to escape by canoe from Plymouth. Uh, the, they feared um, that they were going to be executed um, or treated poorly uh, by Confederate forces because quite a few of them um, were uh, deserters from uh, Confederate units. Uh, there also may have been a massacre of black troops. Uh, there's a lot of contradictory um, evidence out there. Um, we don't we we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, we don't know if these troops were led out into the swamp and some are uh, just executed. Um, and but uh, they may have been running to escape. Um, you know, fearing uh, execution of poor treatment uh, from the uh, um, Confederate forces. We don't know exactly what happened. Uh, then uh, General Rus Wessels was sent off to a variety of, of different uh, prisons before he was exchanged. He was only in prison for less than four months uh, before he, uh, he, he returned to federal lines. Um, however, the enlisted men and regimental officers uh, were sent to Andersonville, Georgia, and placed in a POW camp there. Uh, and this image right here is actually a scene from uh, Andersonville. Uh, it was overcrowded, uh, not enough food to go around, uh, poor sanitation, it was rampant with disease, and just an incredible amount of suffering took place at Andersonville, uh, where quite a few men captured at the Battle of Plymouth uh, ultimately died due to disease and exposure. Uh, the casualties from the Battle of Plymouth, uh, the Confederate forces suffered 163 deaths and 554 wounded. Uh, the Federal forces, however, were not sure how many men were actually killed and wounded. Um, there, there wasn't an exact uh, number ever reported. Uh, the accounts vary wildly. They go all the way from 115 killed and wounded all the way up to 2,600. Um, realistically, though, the, the number is probably somewhere between 115 and 200 uh, killed and wounded in the action. Uh, there was a sort of brief investigation. I'm not even sure if investigation is the, the right word, but certainly a study um, into the fall of Plymouth. And the sort of main question that the, uh, the U.S. Army had was, could General Wessels have held Plymouth? Um, the Army's cons primary concerns was that uh, he was well enough supplied um, to have held out for a protracted siege, um, and they felt, due to correspondence that they obtained, that the, uh, the casualties suffered by federal forces was rather light, um, and that the position was largely intact um, when uh, Confederate forces uh, overran the town. However, uh, there are quite a few mitigating factors in this. Um, 
that was also examined. Um, measures had been taken to defend Plymouth. Uh, for instance, the hull, the, the ships that were sunk uh, farther up river, uh, the hundred pounder, the two hundred pounder that had been obtained at one point in, in uh, uh, September eighteen sixty three. Uh, Wessels had actually um, requested uh, a Union um, ironclad to be posted at Plymouth uh, because they knew that wooden ships would not be able to stand up to a Confederate ironclad ram. Um, additional resources had also been uh, requested other than uh, an ironclad. They also had uh, requested um, reinforcements. However, none were available at the time. Um, there is also... Um, uh, the, the study also concluded that Plymouth, Plymouth's eastern flank, it was uh, there, there weren't enough earthworks or fortifications on that side of town, and uh, the, the sort of defense there was dependent upon the gunboats. And so uh, the study ultimately concluded, um, as well as other evidence that came forward, was that uh, Wessels was not to blame for the fall of Plymouth. Uh, he desperately needed uh, naval support. Um, and the Navy wasn't at fault either. It had done its best, but it was no, those wooden hulls were just no match for the Albemarle. And so the battle's aftermath, what happened afterwards? Uh, on April 25th, 1864, Hoke advanced on uh, Washington, and uh, by the 30th, uh, federal forces had abandoned uh, Washington, fearing a, another Plymouth. Um, on May 4th, uh, Hoke prepared to attack New Bern and actually uh, began uh, uh, attacking um, on the 5th and the 6th. And uh, on May 5th, the Battle of Albemarle Sound or Battle of Sandy Point, Battle of Bachelors Bay, uh, there's several names for this battle, but there is this epic uh, naval engagement that occurred out in the Albemarle Sound. Uh, not far from Plymouth, involving the CSS Albemarle and the Federal Navy, and it was fought to a stalemate, and ultimately the Albemarle had to return um, to uh, uh, Plymouth due to damage that it incurred. Um, but the Albemarle was supposed to have uh, steamed on down to New Bern to have assisted Hoke in the uh, capture, capture of New Bern. Uh, fortunately, though, uh, the Albemarle was stopped, and Hoke was also recalled to Virginia to uh, support General Lee and uh, uh, operations around Richmond. Um, Plymouth was finally recaptured by federal forces on April 31st, 1864. And that's actually another study that I'm going to do a talk on later this year. Um, I'm going to give a talk in late October um, on uh, the on William Cushing and the uh, destruction of the Albemarle. It's a, a fascinating and, and harrowing story. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, y'all will uh, show up to the museum to uh, learn about that in October. Then here's just uh, my uh, bibliography of uh, works that I consulted for this uh, presentation. All right, so that ties everything up. I hope you all had a good time listening to this presentation, and uh, um, we'll see you all later. Have a good one. Bye.